before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Shall we look at some examples now and say what we think is good or bad about them? I suppose we should start with Amsterdam, as this was one of the first cities to have a bike-sharing scheme. Yes, there was already a strong culture of cycling here. In a way, it's strange that there was such a demand for bike-sharing because you'd have thought most people would have used their own bikes. And yet it's one of the best used schemes. Dublin's an interesting example of a success story. It must be because the public transport system's quite limited. Not really. There's no underground, but there are trams and a good bus network. I'd say price has a lot to do with it. It's one of the cheapest schemes in Europe to join. But the buses are really slow. Anyway, the weather certainly can't be a factor. No, definitely not. The London scheme's been quite successful. Yes, it's been a really good thing for the city. The bikes are popular and the whole system is well maintained, but it isn't expanding quickly enough. Basically, not enough's been spent on increasing the number of cycle lanes. Hopefully that'll change. Yes. Now, what about outside Europe? Well, bike-sharing schemes have taken off in places like Buenos Aires. Hmm. They built a huge network of cycle lanes to support the introduction of the scheme there, didn't they? It attracted huge numbers of cyclists where, previously, there were hardly any. An example of good planning. Absolutely. New York is a good example of how not to introduce a scheme. When they launched it, it was more than ten times the price of most other schemes. More than it costs to take a taxi. Crazy. I think the organisers lacked vision and ambition there. I think so too. Sydney would be a good example to use. I would have expected it to have grown pretty quickly here. Yes. I can't quite work out why it hasn't been an instant success like some of the others. It's a shame, really. I know. OK, so now we've thought about all the... Shall we look at some examples now and say what we think is good or bad about them? I suppose we should start with Amsterdam, as this was one of the first cities to have a bike-sharing scheme. Yes, there was already a strong culture of cycling here. In a way, it's strange that there was such a demand for bike-sharing, because you'd have thought most people would have used their own bikes. And yet it's one of the best-used schemes. Dublin's an interesting example of a success story. It must be because the public transport system's quite limited. Not really. There's no underground, but there are trams and a good bus network. I'd say price has a lot to do with it. It's one of the cheapest schemes in Europe to join. But the buses are really slow. Anyway, the weather certainly can't be a factor. No, definitely not. The London scheme's been quite successful. Yes, it's been a really good thing for the city. The bikes are popular and the whole system is well maintained, but it isn't expanding quickly enough. Basically, not enough's been spent on increasing the number of cycle lanes. Hopefully that'll change. Yes. Now, what about outside Europe? Well, bike-sharing schemes have taken off in places like Buenos Aires. Hmm. They built a huge network of cycle lanes to support the introduction of the scheme there, didn't they? It attracted huge numbers of cyclists where, previously, there were hardly any. An example of good planning. Absolutely. New York is a good example of how not to introduce a scheme. When they launched it, it was more than ten times the price of most other schemes. More than it costs to take a taxi. Crazy. I think the organisers lacked vision and ambition there. I think so too. Sydney would be a good example to use. 
I would have expected it to have grown pretty quickly here. Yes. I can't quite work out why it hasn't been an instant success like some of the others. It's a shame, really. I know. OK, so now we've thought about all the... Background. If you're preparing to take the IELTS test, you're not alone. Over 2 million people all over the world take the test each year. A knowledge of English is increasingly important for people who want to enter the higher education or work in countries where English is the first language. And IELTS is widely recognized by universities and colleges, professional bodies, employers, immigration authorities and other government agencies. Academic and General Training Tests There are two versions of IELTS, Academic and General Training or GT. When you enroll, you can choose which version you want to take. You should take IELTS Academic if you want to study in higher education, for example, on an undergraduate or postgraduate course at a university where the teaching is in English. You should take the general training version if you intend to live and work in an English-speaking country and need to show the migration authorities that you have the required level of English. Your teacher can advise you on the version which is appropriate for you, or you can contact the organization you intend to apply to and find out which one they require. The test. There are four parts to the test, listening, reading, writing and speaking, and you must take them all. The total test time is 2 hours and 45 minutes. The tests of listening and speaking are the same for all candidates, but the tests of reading and writing are different depending on whether you chose the academic or general versions. You do the listening, reading and writing tests on the same day, and usually the speaking test is done a few days before or after the other components. Scoring IELTS assesses your language knowledge and skills and gives you a band score from 1 to 9 in each of the four parts of the test, and also an overall band score from 1 to 9 for the whole exam, which is an average of the scores for each part. There is no pass or fail in IELTS because the college, university, or organization you're applying to will tell you the band score you need to achieve. IELTS Band Scores Band 9, Expert User Has fully operational command of the language. Appropriate, accurate and fluent with complete understanding. Band 8, Very Good User Has fully operational command of the language with only occasional unsystematic inaccuracies and inappropriencies. Misunderstandings may occur in unfamiliar situations. Handles complex detailed argumentation well. Band 7, good user. Has operational command of the language, though with occasional inaccuracies, inappropriaces, and misunderstandings in some situations. Generally handles complex language well and understands detailed reasoning. Band 6, competent user has generally effective command of the language despite some inaccuracies, inappropriaces, and misunderstandings. Can use and understand fairly complex language, particularly in familiar situations. Band 5, Modest User Has partial command of the language, coping with overall meaning in most situations, though is likely to make many mistakes should be able to handle basic communication in own field. Band 4, Limited User Basic competence is limited to familiar situations. Has frequent problems in understanding and expression. Is not able to use complex language. Band 3, Extremely Limited User conveys and understands only general meaning in very familiar situations. Frequent breakdowns in communication occur. Band 2, Intermittent User No real communication is possible except for the most basic information using isolated words or short formulae in familiar situations and to meet immediate needs. 
has great difficulty understanding spoken and written English. Band 1, non-user. Essentially has no ability to use the language beyond possibly a few isolated words. Band 0, did not attempt the test no accessible information provided. 